I know I can barely see you guys in the audience, but I still want to ask you some questions. Do we have anyone in the audience who speaks uh, German? Uh huh. Excellent. Anybody who speaks French? Wow, impressive. Latin? Anybody? Spanish. <laughs> I think I saw one or two hands there. That's impressive. I'm sorry. Italian. Italian. Right. Okay. Well, this is this is fantastic because all of these uh, languages have dramatically influenced um, the English language. And those of you who do speak some German, French, or Latin will be able to appreciate the impact that these languages have um, made on the English language. Um, now, obviously, it's almost impossible to tell everything about the history of the English language in, in an hour and a half. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to try and give you some of the major highlights of the evolution of the English language throughout centuries. Uh, and I would like to present to you our lovely performers who will be singing and playing for you tonight. We have Franziska Havrun playing the keyboards and singing. We have Makar Havrun who plays the percussions. And we have the one and only Nadezhda uh, Petrushina who plays the Celtic harp Black flutes and the guitar. Nadia, can you please start playing? Um. Okay, so as you probably know, the mother of many language families um, is, of course, the Proto-Indo-European family. Um, actually, the Proto-Indo-European language, and it is indeed the mother of many language families, including um, uh, Greek, uh, Slavic, Germanic, um, Indian, and Celtic. And very few Celtic words survive in modern English. In fact, literally 20 words. Most of these are, um, these, most of these would be words, names of locations, uh, rivers, towns, London, for example, Leeds, the River Thames. And what happens in about five century BC is the Celts begin to move around Europe and until they finally reach the British Isles. And this is where um, the, the various dialects of the Celtic language uh, begin to spread. Now, the, um, the Celts who went to Northern Europe spoke Gaulish, the Celts who went to Ireland and Scotland spoke uh, Gaelic, and the Celts who went to Southern England and Wales spoke Britannic. Uh, like I said, very few Celtic words survive in modern English because they, um, over the years, uh, they, they were, I mean, Celtic language is pretty much uh, substituted by Germanic and later many uh, French words. Um, however, we do want to perform a song which uh, does retain some roots of the uh, ancient uh, Celtic language. And we're going to sing um, a very old Celtic song. Uh, it will be sung in Gaelic. We don't really know how long it is. Um, it probably doesn't go back to as early as the 5th century BC. However, like I said, it will give you some idea of the archaic, um, um, archaic uh, Gaelic language, which is a direct um, uh, descendant of the Proto-Celtic language. So, are you guys ready? Yes, we are.
Right, so this was a fairly old song sung in Gaelic, and the second song we want to sing for you will be sung in Britannic. Now, this song is also known as the Song of the Cider, and it was recorded in early 20th century in France, um, in the area of Brittany. Now, why exactly Brittany? Well, because some of the Celtic tribes um, uh, escaped um, in about 5, 6th century um, AD, uh, fled from the British Isles and uh, went to Northern Europe to escape the uh, Germanic invasion. And this is where this uh, beautiful song was recorded. It's actually quite famous. Again, it's not, um, a very, it's not an archaic first millennium kind of song, but again, it will give you some idea of the Celtic roots um, um, that um, barely, have barely survived in the modern English. So the song of the cider, everybody. <laughs> understand anything in the song? <laughs> I'm sorry? Yes! Yes, well, we do have the lyrics, of course. We have the modern English and the uh, Breton language. However, uh, there is probably just one word which is barely recognizable. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's probably the only word that kind of rings a bell. <laughs> right. Um, now, uh, we're going to move on to the next slide. And... Um, we can probably start, well, this is not, um, this is not really the beginnings of, uh, of, um, of English per se, but this is the time which was quite important um, um, in the evolution of the language. This is when the Romans invade Britain, and um, 
um, they come to the British Isles around the 1st century um, AD, and they remain on the British Isles for about four centuries. Um, of course, they bring their language with them. They bring Latin. They also introduce um, a very, uh, um, a very um, ex um, uh, advanced culture and civilization. And the aristocracy of um, the, the Celtic aristocracy begin to speak Roman language. I'm sorry, Latin language. Um, now. The uh, Romans leave Britain in about uh, 410, so early 5th century. And at that point, uh, the Latin language didn't have that much of an impact on the development of um, English. But what had a major influence was, of course, the invasion of the Germanic tribes. And this is when we can start talking about the beginnings of um, Old English. Now, as you know, we, we have Old English, Middle English, and Modern English. Now, this is when Old English begins. Now, around uh, 5th century AD, um, Germanic tribes invade the British Isles. Jutes, Angles, and Saxons come in very big numbers. Um, they settle, they do not assimilate um, Celtic language, and they bring their language with them. So Old English begins to develop from the various dialects of these various Germanic tribes. Um, so like I said, the um, Anglo-Saxons keep their own language. Uh, the vocabulary of Old English um, is um, uh, actually mostly Germanic. Um, the, um, and uh, you will see that Old English uh, is very, very, I mean, in many ways, is still quite similar to modern German. So you will find a lot of similarities, especially towards the uh, 10th, 11th centuries. Um, now, in about the 6th century, Romans um, come back to the British Isles, and this time the Roman monks arrive and they bring Christianity. And this was a very important benchmark in the development of the language because um, a lot of new words were introduced um, from the Latin language uh, to Old English. Now monks begin to build churches, cathedrals. They start teaching Latin and Greek. Um, uh, interestingly, about 85% of Old English vocabulary has disappeared from Modern English. And of course, the grammar and syntax of Old English were very, very different. We're going to try and illustrate um, this uh, fascinating uh, time in the, the, in the history of the English language with a little bit of um, poetry. Um, actually, before we do that, it's worth saying that in the 9th century, King Alfred makes a very important step. Uh, he chooses to make English, not Latin, the language of education literature. And why is that important? Uh, simply because when you start writing in a language, you give a major boost to its uh, development. I mean, the grammar begins to become more complex, the vocabulary expands. So this was quite an important um, step. Now, a fascinating piece, probably the oldest piece of old English literature surviving is, of course, the ballad called uh, Beowulf. It was written in around 8th century. Um, it is basically based on Danish um, history and folk tales. Um, it was composed by a Northumbria poet, and it is um, an interesting story of a brave man called Beowulf who managed to fight and kill a terrible animal, monster. And this uh, beautiful piece of um, old English literature is, um, has survived. So we actually have the original scripts. They are kept in the British Library in London. And just to give you an idea of what the language could sound like at this time, again, this is only an attempt to reconstruct the original pronunciation. So don't judge too hard, but um, let's uh, hear an extract from the prologue. No. 
Quatwe gardena in yardagum, Seid cuninga primia prunon, Hutha edelinga sellen fremedot. Oft shield shaving shaldena thratum, Monigum maithum meldo settla of terch, Eizo de erolas, Sith an arist werth fair shaft funda. He thes frovri ye bad, Wakes under wognum werth mindum tha, of that him a quilch thara um sitendra over hrom rare huran shode gomban yudan that was good kuning. Them elvera was after kenned jung and yeldum thone god sende fuket of frovri fyrin terabil. Right. <laughs> That's Old English, everybody, uh, about the 8th, 9th century um, AD. Did anybody recognize any words whatsoever? I'm sorry? After, After. uh-huh. Under. I'm sorry? Under. under, yes, I think it was, I believe it was pronounced as under. Also, funden, yeah? Um, actually, we still have that verb in German. Uh, today, we say find, found, found. But in German, it's actually finden, uh, funden, I think, and fund gefunden, yeah, yeah. So there you go. Also, König. Uh huh. There you go. But in fact, very few, very few words are recognizable from Old English of the 8th century. Moving on. Oh, yes. This is, of course, the text. Totally incomprehensible. And, <laughs> and um, a translation into modern English. And we are moving on uh, and just going to go over some of the interesting facts about the old and modern English. Now, like I said, that words that survive in modern English are quite basic. Um, and these are actually very, very old words. So some of these would be um, man, it was pronounced as man, uh, child, house was hus, eat, uh, sleep. Um, so some of the very basic verbs, uh, days of the week. The word order was very, very different. I mean, unlike modern day English, when we have a very structured, very rigid word order in sentences, um, this was not the case with Old English. In fact, it was probably more, um, it was probably, it, it was probably more uh, close, it was closer to, um, well, I would say German language, yes. Um, and also maybe Russian. Just like in Russian, we don't really have a very strict word order. So uh, similarly, in the Old English, it wasn't that rigid. Um, there were many more personal pronouns. So for example, uh, we would have pronouns as him, but also to him, her, but also to her, we too, us too, you too, etc. cetera. Um, and the verb and their past tense forms were also very, very different. So there were actually many more irregular verbs than there are today in modern English. Um, actually, some of the, most of the irregular verbs tend to be the, uh, tend to be the oldest. Um, we are gonna try, we're gonna sing another song, and this time we're gonna sing an original, authentic song dating back to as early as 13th century AD. And um, notice how you can already recognize it a little more. And this is not Old English per se. I would say that this is early Middle English. And again, we're talking about the 13th century. Um, and it's actually quite beautiful. Only one verse of this amazing song survives. And um, I'm going to read the lyrics to you. Miritis will summer last with fuchle song. Ochnu necheth windes blast and weder strong. Je je wot des nächtes long, and ich with vel Michel rong, sorech and murn and fast. So, whereas you can recognize some of the words, the pronunciation, of course, remains very, very different. In fact, it's still quite close to German, especially words like nicht, ich, uh, fuchles, um, also the pronunciation of the verbs. Um, and here comes the song. Thank you. 
Again, this was an early 13th century song. It actually an original song dating back to um, this, um, these very, very old times. Now, um, a very, another very important time and a benchmark in the history of the English language is, of course, the Norman Conquest. Um, basically, English was never the same after uh, Normans um, invade the British Isles in about 11th century and conquer England and Wales. Norman French becomes the language of the upper classes, the government and the law. However, common people continue to speak English. Um, and over the four centuries that have followed the Norman conquest, English changed more than in, at any other time in history. Over 10,000 words um, enter English, um, French words, and 75% of them are still in use. The word language itself is of a French origin. So it, you know how we have two words that, um, that we use to, um, uh, to say language, yizik. It's also, we have tongue, which stands for the organ in our mouth, but it also, it's also the older word for the language. And then the word language comes from the French word um, uh, lang. Um, Right, uh, what else uh, was um, happening? Grammar becomes simpler. Um, um, many, uh, like I said, many, many words from um, the French language enter different, um, pretty much they affect every sphere of life. Um, art, um, science, uh, religion, um, daily life. And however, some English and French words exist at the same time because um, the aristocracy would use French words. So for example, for meat on the table, uh, the people would, start, people would start using French words for, like pork and lamb and beef. However, for animals in the fields, the uh, people still continued uh, using the old words like cow and sheep, etc. cetera. Um, we're gonna sing another song uh, which dates back to 14th century um, AD. And this is a good example of Middle English. Um, again, it's also an original song. You will still recognize a lot of Germanic influence, um, a lot of uh, German-like words. The pronunciation is still um, uh, resembles um, a German. For example, uh, many verbs are pronounced as we still pronounce them in German. For example, love instead of love, or have instead of have, krave instead of crave, etc. And um, are you guys ready?
already recognize quite a few words. Um, again, they're still pronounced very, very differently, but um, it's beginning to take shape. Um, now, of course, a very important uh, person, uh, personality, um, that we simply cannot not mention was, of course, Geoffrey Chaucer, Chaucer um, who was one of the greatest writers and poets in Middle English. And um, interestingly, he used a lot of words uh, from French. One of his uh, most famous um, works uh, is the Canterbury Tales, written in about uh, late 14th century. And um, just to give you an idea of how English sounded at that period, um, uh, Piotr, can I please ask you to play the short recording. Again, this will be a short extract from the prologue to the Canterbury Tales. One that April with his sure suit the drooked of March hath pursed to the rota, and bother every vine in switch liqueur of which vertu engendered is the floor. One Zephyrus sack with his sweat a breath, in spirit half in every halt and hath the tender croppis, and the younger sunna hath in the ram his halva corsi runna, and small of foulus magna melodia that slap in all the nicked with open ear so pricketim nature in her courages. Then long in folk to gone on pilgrimages, and palmerers fall to zek in strungus trondus to ferna halwes couth in sundry londus. And specially from every sheerest end of Engelon to Canterbury they wander, the holy blissful martyr for to Sega, that him hath holpen when that thy were Sega.
Right, so that was Geoffrey Chaucer, everybody. Um, and this is what the Middle, middle English text looked like. And this is the modern English translation. I wish I could do that. Maybe next time I will read it myself. <laughs> but not this time. Okay, and we're moving on. And another important benchmark was, of course, the introduction of printing in 1476. And um, um, what's important um, about this event is that East Midlands dialect is now used for printing. So in other words, standard spelling begins. Um, and also the sounds in many words begin to change and even disappear. Um, um, another, of course, uh, dramatic uh, um, time um, was the beginning of, um, well, the age of discovery. This is when uh, so, uh, so many countries, uh, so, so many uh, words poured, foreign words poured into the English language and vocabulary boosted, literally. Um, about 30,000 new words come from 50 different languages. Um, and to give you an idea of the early 16th century English and what it sounded like, we are going to perform a very special song which was actually written by King Henry VIII himself because he was a um, quite gifted man. He wrote it when he was very young, uh, about 18 years old. Uh, along with his many hobbies like art, music, uh, poetry, he was also a very skillful um, writer and hunter and he really enjoyed himself uh, here at the time of his life. <laughs> and yes, one of his many hobbies was uh, writing poetry and uh, music. Um, um, so we're going to give you um, the, well we're going to try and perform the song for you. Uh, are you guys ready? Thank you. 
This song, as you may have uh, figured out, is a kind of a moral justification for the joyful and very careless life that King Henry VIII uh, would lead along with his court. Um, actually, this was a very good time for England. It was politically and economically prospering. Um, so yes, this, the court kind of reflected <laughs> these, um, um, uh, the situation in the country. But King Henry I, um, VIII is actually quite famous for his um, idleness and uh, love for um, um, carefree life and uh, enjoying, in, engaging in many um, pastime activities. However, the point of this song is that it's better to enjoy a company of good friends than be idle. So. Um, now we are moving on to the late um, 16th, early 17th century. And this, of course, was um, a very um, interesting time in the um, history of the English language. This, was, um, this is when the language enjoyed great flowering of uh, literature. And of course, we cannot um, um, not mention William Shakespeare, who is uh, known to have used an extraordinarily rich language. In fact, he introduced um, several thousand words um, and expressions into English, just like Pushkin in uh, Russia. <laughs> Um, so yes, we do uh, value um, Shakespeare for his great contribution into the English language. Um, and again, just to give you an idea of what English sounded like at this time, um, we are going to listen to a short extract from one of his most famous um, works, um, of course, Hamlet. Peter, can we have the video, please? Original pronunciation. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outer misfortune, or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep, no more, and by a sleep, to save the end, the heartache, and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummacy and devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep, to sleep her chance to dream. Aye, there's the rope. For in that slap of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life, for who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, the poor's men contumely, the pans of despised love. The law's delay, the insolence of office, and the sperms that patient merit of the unworthy takes when he himself must his kindness make. With a bare potkin. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, there you go. Um, is the sound a little more familiar? Mm hmm. Yes, it is, isn't it? Well, there are still uh, quite a few uh, peculiar, uh, peculiarities in um, um, pronunciation as well as uh, spelling. Uh, you might have noticed that the word what uh, used to be pronounced as what. Um, <laughs> um, and this is the time when uh, we still use the um, prepositions, uh, sorry, pronouns such as thee, thou, etc. Uh, these will go away in the 17th century. Um, we are going to sing another song. Um, it dates back to late 16th century. It's quite famous. Uh, I'm sure all of you have heard it before. Um, and again, it gives you a good um, idea of um, the English language around the end of, uh, uh, well, late 16th century. So the song is called Green Sleeves. And are you guys ready?
Thank you very much. Um, William Shakespeare, this really, sorry about that. <laughs> right, um, okay, um, another interesting uh, highlight um, in the history of, in the evolution of the English language was um, when King James um, uh, decided to, well, ordered um, to translate the Bible into English, but um, because there were so many different variations of the translation, um, he ordered a single translation to be, um, to be done. Um, and this uh, Bible became, well, quite influential in many ways because it was read in churches, homes, schools, everywhere for the next 300 years. And um, uh, a lot of expressions, and well, idiomatic expressions, we'll call them biblical expressions, they came from this um, version of the Bible. For example, the apple of my eye, um, or all, um, 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 the apple of my eye, or um, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. There are many, many more um, expressions that we have borrowed from this, um, um, this Bible. Um, now, the 17th century um, has seen, well, saw quite a few changes um, in the language. 
Uh, and just to give you some of uh, the few highlights, um, people begin to use do with the main verb. Um, so, for example, it, uh, hmm? so for example, now we use the auxiliary verb. Uh, we used to say something like I know not. Now we say I do not know or I don't know. Um, we no longer use th in the verbs. Like, we used to say loveth, for example, and you may have noticed that in some of the older songs, we no longer do that. Um, the uh, pronouns such as thou, uh, the, etc., cetera, um, are no longer in use. Um, and it's is now used instead of his and her. This is actually when this, this happened. Whoops. And, sorry, sorry about that. Um, we're going to sing another song, uh, which dates back to approximately 18th century. Um, this is actually quite, well, it's, it's a very sad song. Um, it will sound very dynamic, but in fact, it's quite, um, it's quite um, um, a sad song. And um, it basically tells us about the tragedy of the war. And... Are you guys ready? We dedicate it to, the, to this. Yes, we actually want to dedicate it to um, a tragic um, event that happened in Bislan many years ago. And today we're actually, um, today is the day of the memory of that event. So this is what we want to dedicate it to. You guys ready?
Thank you. Okay. Um, and we are reaching the end of our talk. Um, we're going to take a look at um, the 18th century. And what happens in the 18th century is that uh, order is brought to English. Um, this was the time when people were wondering a lot about what's happening to the language because it was changing so quickly and so many words were pouring into the language from so many different languages that people were actually wondering that English is going to remain English and um, where everybody was going. Um, so uh, a lot of people were concerned um, about uh, the future of the English language and uh, some even, well, some even uh, uh, thought, believed, um, it would be a wise idea to um, even organize associations that would oversee the purity of the English language, just like in French, for example. This, however, never happened, but this was a time when a lot of spelling guides, dictionaries, and grammar books begin to appear because, well, they were in great demand. Um, and perhaps one of the most famous dictionaries was Samuel Johnson's uh, Dictionary of the English Language. Uh, uh, why it's important? Because this was probably the first most comprehensive attempt to um, explain um, over 42,000 words um, along with examples of usage. Of course, it was not perfect, but it was an amazing contribution. Um, Another interesting um, uh, book that was published at that time was a critical pronouncing dictionary and ex um, expositor of the English language. And this is when uh, the dictionary um, suggested as a standard of pronunciation the aristocratic London dialect. And this is when many people began to feel at a disadvantage people from the, uh, well, the provinces, the regions, um, speaking dialects. And this carried on for almost two centuries, in fact. Um, the final song we're going to sing tonight is um, a beautiful song. Um, it's called Down by the Sally Gardens. It was uh, recorded in a uh, village um, uh, around late 19th century, and it is based on a folk song. However, only first verse, uh, first two um, phrases of the song um, are original uh, folk song um, work, uh, words, and the rest were uh, written. Um, and um, we're going to try and sing it for you right now. So, down by the Sally Gardens.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, let's hear it for Francisca Favrun. Nadezhda Petrushina. And Makar Favrun. And your humble servant. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I hope you have enjoyed the evening. I hope you've learned something tonight. I know it's very difficult to put so many facts in just an hour and a half, but I hope you walk away with something, um, with a few facts that you have um, learned, and also some beautiful music. So thank you again for coming, and enjoy your evening. Good night. <laughs>